Right, oh, off you go. Fine. Great. Thank you. Good morning. A very uh, good morning to everyone. Um, I'm going to start uh, by introducing myself and, and very happy to see some old colleagues, you know, introducing themselves in the chat box. Very happy to be connecting with you today. My name is Mona Aika and I'm a child protection specialist for UNICEF East and Southern Africa Regional Office. We call it in short SRO. And uh, a very warm welcome to all the government representatives who are with us today, uh, changing the way we care colleagues, um, other colleagues from other agencies and organizations like Hope and Homes for Children, uh, UNICEF child protection colleagues, and the various CSO partners working in the area of care reform in the region and beyond. Uh, before we start, I'd like to go through some of a quick uh, webinar protocols. Uh, if you haven't done so already, please introduce yourself in the chat box, type your name, your job title, and the country that you're uh, uh, working from. I'll also uh, uh, request Bertha if we can also administer the polls uh, to, to, the, to the dear participants so that they can complete a short poll to know where, who is everybody and where they're located, which region. And as please take time to, to fill in uh, that poll. This is important to us. We want to see how, the coverage of this, uh, of this platform. And once we start receiving uh, the responses, just alert me, Emily, and I'll stop so that we can see the, 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 res the results. Um, I'm also uh, reminding participants to mute your microphone during this session, the whole session. You're encouraged to, to type in the chat box any questions or comments that you may have in the course of the various uh, sessions that are, have been organized for today, and we'll ensure that uh, we respond. You may also use the raise hand uh, icon if you want to ask a question directly, and we'll take all the questions, you know, we'll open the floor for Q&A uh, towards the end of, uh, of the final uh, panel discussion. The webinar is recorded, as you've heard at the beginning, and will be shared with all of you after this session for your reference. Um, again, just to flag, if you want to join a mailing list of this uh, learning platform, there'll be a link posted in the, in the chat box. So you can click there and your email will be added to the mailing list. Or you can also write directly to Emily or myself um, by giving us your name, title and organization and country that you're from. And the email you want to be contacted on, then you will manually add you to the mailing list. So what is this uh, regional learning platform on uh, child care reform? Um, the learning platform on care uh, is, has been established by UNICEF in collaboration with Changing Day We Care. And the purpose of it is really to exchange learning on care across Eastern and Southern Africa region. Uh, the management of the platform is supported by a consultancy firm by the name of Child Frontiers. And of course, we have Emily Dillop, the lead consultant. She can give us a wave. And her team, Bertha and Ishmael, if you're on the call, switch on your videos and give us a wave. So these are, that's the team that's really supporting us with the management and the organization of these various webinars that we have and the publications as well. Uh, the regional learning platform on care reform provides an opportunity for government uh, UNICEF and CSOs in Eastern and Southern Africa to share learning on care. Um, we started off this platform back in 2020, towards the end of 2020, it was I think October, and have included various sessions from virtual study tours, a series of webinars, and we still have a help desk, what we call as a help desk, which is basically my email or Emily's email uh, shared for to all. And if you have any questions or you need more information on any aspects of care, you write to us and we'll ensure that we provide the appropriate response to you. We are currently in phase two. Phase two will be ending, will be running up to January 2023 into the new year. And, um, and then we'll proceed with phase three, what we call as phase three. And really the operationalization of this uh, platform has been made possible with the generous funding from the USAID's uh, Dis Displaced Children and Orphans Fund through UNICEF SRO. So we really appreciate that support uh, from USAID. Um, this, the sessions are being uh, uh, run through webinars, as I mentioned. We also have reflective practice, small group exchanges, practitioner videos, and case, uh, case studies. I'll pause there and, and to, to see the, the results of the poll. <laughs> Who is on the call, Emily? 
Uh, we seem to have mostly people from the region, but a few people from elsewhere in the world, uh, strong representation from UNICEF and government and some NGOs as well. Thank Brilliant. you. <laughs> Brilliant. So happy to see when we have government participation and a very warm welcome to all the government representatives on this call and to everybody else as well. So we have case studies developed um, as part of the learning platform uh, on, uh, and they're focusing on uh, children in care, care leavers, and I mentioned earlier, a help desk, desk, and we also have monthly updates. So there's a newsletter generated every end of the month, which kind of captures all the activities run uh, throughout that month, but we're, we're sending it out uh, on, and also uh, advertises or informs of the upcoming events, including webinars that are planned for as part of this learning platform. Um, so for the webinar today, as many of you already know, you have the interest, that's how you have joined, we hope. The webinar today is on supporting the reintegration of children with disabilities. And we're looking, we're going to travel all the way to Rwanda, um, where we'll see what Rwanda has done uh, to ensure the care for children is being extended, not just uh, to children without disabilities, but also children with disabilities. And uh, with UNICEF support, the government of Rwanda are now in the final phases of their care reform program. And of course, there are many um, actors who work alongside government and CSOs like Hope and Homes for Children, amongst others, to support this uh, care process. And having returned the majority of children from residential care back to families and communities, uh, Rwanda is now working on the reintegration of children with disabilities. In this webinar, we'll hear from policymakers, practitioners on how this has been done and the key lessons learned. Uh, to deliver the session, we'll hear from uh, the government of Rwanda. We'll start off with Monica, Mo Mo Monica Mukamana, who is the acting program manager of the national program called TMM, um, Tuberi Muriango program, Let's Raise Children in Families, it's an English program. And, uh, and Monique is, um, is, uh, is representing the National Child Development Agency in Rwanda, NCDA. We'll also hear from Genevieve or Maria, who is our Child Protection Officer of UNICEF Rwanda Country Office. Uh, the webinar will start off by an overview presentation uh, that will be delivered on kinship care in Africa, uh, and uh, not, not kinship care, my, my sincere apologies, on the reintegration mm -hmm. of, uh, of children with disabilities in Rwanda. And we'll know why, how, and all those questions that many of us have on our mind. We'll hear uh, that overview before we proceed to the panel discussion that will be facilitated by Emily Dillup. And of course, Emily will also introduce the panelists at that, at that juncture. So without further ado, but before I do that, uh, just to again remind you all in the course of the presentation and the panel discussion, you know, type your question or comment that you have in the chat box so that you don't forget. But of course, we will have the Q&A session towards the end so that we can interact uh, together and, uh, and we, we can hear your voice. So raise your hand at the end should you want to intervene. Without further ado, let me now pass the floor to uh, Emily, who will then pass it to Genevieve and Monique, over to you. Thank you so much, Mona. I'm just going to hand over straight away to, I think Monique's going to take us forward with the presentation initially. So over to you, Monique. Thank you to everyone. Yes, um, uh, as uh, uh, Mona said, I'm Monique Mkamana, acting uh, program manager to the Muriango program uh, in Rwanda. Uh, we go through for this uh, presentation, uh, but first of all, we thank uh, UNICEF Regional Office and uh, Child Fund for organizing this webinar uh, that is going to, to focus uh, on the integration of children with disabilities uh, in Rwanda. Um, uh, we look forward that we are going to have good exchanges uh, on the critical topic, uh, and we focus on uh, uh, children with their uh, uh, disabilities. Uh, second, uh, go to the second uh, slide. Um, yes, uh, this is uh, the content. We are going to go through the mandate of National Child Development Agency uh, as a, a child protection agency here in Rwanda. Uh, I will be also um, 
go for the, uh, the care talk a bit little on child care reform. Or oh, then I go for uh, the TMM program, which is uh, uh, TMM is Tuwarele Muriango program in Rwanda, but English is Let's Raise Children into uh, Families. Then we go uh, for two phases of uh, this program. The first one was um, uh, focused on uh, DR, the integration of children from institutions into or uh, back to their families. And, and the community uh, and also uh, prevention of separation of children uh, with their families. Uh, but the second phase, uh, we focus on reintegration of children with disabilities. Uh, and the final, we see uh, running key running or key reason rent uh, to link uh, social services workforce uh, and the um, under the child protection system approach. Next. Uh, the national child, uh, here I want to remind this national child development agency uh, is a new name, but not uh, um, uh, a new uh, mandate because this is uh, 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 a former um, or a new institution that is uh, uh, combining or, or, or it is a major of the former national charge, uh, uh, the national uh, the commission for uh, uh, the National Commission for Children and also uh, the ECD program that form this uh, National Child Development Agency. Um, and our mandate, uh, as I said, is not, is not uh, or uh, our mission is not new because we continue to foster the development of a child, uh, the promotion and the protection of their families. And our role is to guarantee all shared protection, all children are protected in the comprehensive standards. Yes, and uh, we put our role, as we see, it is to protect children from all forms of, uh, of violence, exploitation, neglect, and also to reduce the risk uh, and the vulnerability of children into their uh, families. Uh, next. Next uh, slide. Uh, uh, here I want to come back on the a short on the background of this uh, program. Uh, as uh, we used to present this in a different uh, uh, webinar, um, that's why I'll be brief here. As you know, in 2012, uh, in response of national, it is a national survey of institution uh, care, uh, which was a baseline of the number of children orphanage across the whole country. It is from here uh, where the government of Rwanda adopted the landmark of, uh, 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 of this strategy for national child care uh, reform. But to, and this was uh, in the line of um, the Convention on the Right of Children with Disabilities. Uh, on the right uh, of the church and also national roles and the uh, priorities uh, to ensure children living in institutions can uh, instead grow up uh, in a family, in a loving family and in a loving, safe environment, which is a, a family. But to implement this uh, strategy, it is where in 2013, uh, the government established uh, this uh, uh, the Tuareg Muriango program mm -hmm. as an implementing tool of this uh, strategy for national child care uh, reform. Uh, then, uh, and what I want to remind, this was also an idea from children with the uh, children while there was in a national summit, uh, and this happened every year, and children are. Uh, welcomed and uh, gathered together to to in the parliament and they express their ideas, their views, and also their concern. It is where when we're at the seventh children's summit where they express this uh, idea. And um, as we have this institutional uh, survey, uh, which gives us the number of children who are raised into uh, orphanage. That's why the government has started to put in place this strategy and also the implementation framework, which is uh, to the program. Next slide. 
uh, from this uh, implementation framework that we have program. Uh, from 2012 uh, till now, we have already integrated this uh, number of children, 3,465 uh, from orphanage into families. Uh, we have also a social workforce where we have 68 professionals, social work and psychologists uh, deployed in all 30 districts uh, supporting uh, children. We have also, uh, we, we did, we transformed these orphanage who have been caring children. They have also uh, transformed into child centered community based structures. All of them uh, have uh, now, uh, at present, they have other activities serving children from the community. Uh, and we have also, we continue to support these children financially, psychologically, socially, to avoid uh, a new separation of children um, with their families. We continue also to conduct uh, to conduct a monitoring visit, uh, and this is done. And this visit are conducted by our professionals, uh, these social workers and psychologists. And uh, we want these children to be supported through uh, a functional child protection and care system. This uh, child protection, this Muryango uh, program was uh, an entry point to build this child protection system here in Rwanda. That's why you see we have this social workforce in the press in every district. We continue to support families and we continue also uh, to conduct, uh, to, 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 to visit these children till they come, uh, till they become resilient and also uh, we prevent new uh, we support families to prevent uh, separation from their uh, families. Next. Uh, uh, how, how was the process for child care reform? Uh, we started by the community awareness and engagement of local leaders, of course, to help us to, to go together uh, in these uh, activities. We engage local authorities and different uh, SC, uh, civil societies, uh, faith-based organization. Also, uh, we provide family counseling and support. Uh, after engaging the community and the, the local leaders, we go, we put in the place social work for the group in the place, and we provide the capacity building to them. Uh, that uh, uh, these uh, these are uh, these professional are made of social workers and psychologists, but at the community level we have uh, friends of families which we call ISU, and we get them to hear from them during this webinar. Uh, then we have case management and placement. Uh, this um, this. Uh, um, this case management uh, and the process we used when we link children, uh, we take children from uh, orphanage and also the service linking them from with services in the community. Then after integration, we continue to monitor uh, how these children are, how these children can uh, continue to be. Um, uh, reintegrated and uh, into uh, their uh, family. Sorry, Emery, I'm changing uh, the place where I was working. No. Uh, but yes, but we no can problem. continue. Yes, we, no problem. We just have about another five or six minutes left for the presentation, Monique, if that's okay. Okay. I'll yes, move, we'll go for the next. The you're giving us a nice, yes. the nice tour of the uh, NCDA offices in Rwanda at the same time, so we can see the context you're working in. Oh, we may. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as I said, we have. Um, do you hear me? We can hear you now. Yes, thank you. Oh, Please okay, go thank ahead. you. Yes. Uh, after integrating these children from. Orphanage, as I said, the first phase was focusing on the DI of children living in a situation, but these children were uh, uh, not have disabilities. Even if you have some of them who have disabilities in some orphanage, but this was not focusing on uh, these children's disabilities. That's why um, we, we shift. Why uh, here I'm going to show why do we shift for or uh, integrate and focus on inclusive. Uh, reintegration of children with disabilities. Uh, here it is um, 
uh, it is we, as I said, in it, when we started in 2013, but when we arrived in 2017, we conduct a summative evaluation of a TMM program. Then we found that even if we, we placed children to families, but these children with disabilities demand in institutions. Why? Because it was difficult using our uh, case management forms that was in place. It was not adapted to the integration of children of disabilities. As a response to these evaluation results, that's where the government and partners acknowledge that the methodology using in the first one was not sufficient and uh, was not considering the speciality or the, speci uh, the, the special needs of these children. And then we decide to adapt these forms to become more inclusive. This is not, this was not a new project, but it was to adapt or to make to improve our case management. That's why from here, I'm on, uh, for the next slide, I request my colleague uh, Genevieve to continue uh, to show how we go for this uh, inclusive chairman. Yeah, thank you, Monique, uh, for a good introduction on the chat cat form in Rwanda. And thank you, Emily, and your presenters, uh, or, or uh, uh, participants in this webinar. Uh, as Monique was saying, the, the starting point here in Rwanda was the first to know where are those children with disabilities. Of course, there are some who are in the, their communities with their families, though not necessarily in a good condition. But there were also some, many of them who had been, who were in institution. Uh, currently, the, the report shows, uh, the survey that was conducted shows that there are more than 2,000 children, approximately 2,000 children in institutional care. So um, the, the journey started by first working on also improving the condition of children with disabilities who are currently in institutional care because it was thought that it was not very possible to have all children back to families in one or two years. It is a long journey which has to go smoothly. So it started by developing the standard operating procedures for the for, for institutions, including the daycare centers, even in special homes, in the case there is a need for some of children to stay in the special homes for some particular needs. And also in the res for residential care, because those who are in the residential care, though there is a plan to reintegrate, as I was saying, it will take, it would take time, but at least now it was time to think about improving the service provision where they are. And these SOPs were endorsed together with the national policy uh, by the cabinet in, in, in May 20, uh, 21, but they have started being uh, implemented already uh, by different institutions. And um, so next, next slide. Yeah, next slide again. I was take, this is the one I completed. And uh, also along in the parallel, UNICEF has uh, provided technical support to uh, NCDA and the NCPD, the National Council of Persons with Disabilities, and the National Child Development Agency, to, to, to revise the existing operational guide, the, the guide that was there for TMM before, that Monique was talking about, to make it more inclusive. And uh, this guide has been, um, and this has been developed through a consultative process by UNICEF also, but uh, with the uh, using USAID funding. Next time. Um, the roadmap, uh, the, the, this guide and the, the guidance are having, um, the operational guide goes with the facilitator's guide. I think you can go to the next slide again. Yeah, this is the operational guide on inclusive children with integration, which, uh, has really been a very good tool, which is supporting the professionals to acquire more skills to be able to reintegrate children with disabilities. Uh, it has, so it, it has uh, some adaptation where mainly on including a specific guidance on children with disabilities. 
And then with the capacity building, it goes with the facilitator's guide and the, the participant's guide. And also the case management processes and the, and the forms, uh, which will be talked about a little, a little bit at the end of the presentation, they were also revised. And this guidance is comprised of like four main parts, three main parts, sorry. No, there are four. The one is just the overall context of case management, uh, of reintegration. Uh, what are the legal framework? Why is this important? What are the, the commitments uh, according to the global uh, commitments and the treaties? Why is it important for Rwanda? to embark on also doing inclusive reintegration because it is the right of all children. Then part two is about SOPs on the integrating children with disabilities. What is being done and how to do it and also who should be. Uh, and the part three, which was totally new, is called the job aid and it talks more about disabilities Specifically, uh, and uh, and this one is uh, just about introducing the, the professionals on what is disability, what what are the types and the effects of disability on children or on families, and uh, understanding the context of disability in general and how can and, and how this will interact with their day work as they are integrating children with disabilities and uh, this may come uh, more in details in at the end of during maybe discussion panel discussion then part 4 was about the case management forms which were used being used by TMM from the beginning as Monique was presenting and they have been reviewed to be inclusive for example, if you go to, to assess a child with disability, there are some other aspects of special needs that you have to look to uh, that are, were not part of the forms before during the integration of all other children without the disabilities. And the, all the steps have been reviewed and to make them inclusive. Yeah. Next slide. Uh, and the other, the other tools that have been done was about developing the training package also for ISU, ISU and Ishut ISU Muriango and uh, in Kinyarwanda and in, in English it is the Friends of the Family. This is, uh, these are the community-based child protection volunteers. They are two by village uh, nationwide. In total there are 29,674 Ishut ISU in Rwanda. And it is a male and a female at each Mudugudu, and we have one here. She will tell you about the, her their contribution in this process. The facilitators' guide for ISU uh, was also developed. Actually, it is just a, sim a very simplif simplified version of the operational guide for the professionals, and it was also with the facilitators' manual and the ISU handbook and the. Uh, these were um, developed and translated into Kenya Rwanda to be used in the community. There is also what we call the parent sheet that we will see on the other down there. This is a kind of flipboard that they use with the images and the and the, the uh, like straightforward information on disability that they use in visiting in, for home visits, when they go for home visit, it helps them, this tool helps them to explain what is disability, for example, what are the child de development basics for, uh, for each child, the milestone, so that this can help in the early intervention. Uh, also, there is a how to communicate with a child with disability based on particular type of disability. And also on informing them on how to link families, children with disabilities and their families to existing services within the locality and for first aid help, if I can call it the first aid, because sometimes there is need also to continue with the referral at a higher level whenever it is possible. And uh, these tools have been used and the training have taken place uh, all over the country. And the uh, ISO are really now very helpful in, in supporting 
children with disabilities who are integrated together with their families. Yeah. Next slide. Okay, so the guiding principles, I'm trying to go first because of my recent of time. Yeah, then uh, the principles which have guided the development of these tools is the non-discrimination. Also, it is about focusing on individual needs. We know that uh, for disability inclusion, there is always the universal approach, but there is also the targeting. The targeting is very important because it is the one that approach that helps us to go to, to address the special needs of each individual child and each individual families because they don't resemble even if they are in the same community, but they don't necessarily share the same needs. And uh, there is also child participation, children, wherever, whenever it is possible, if they are giving their voice on the whole process. Uh, sometimes also it is the caregiver on behalf of the child, but the consultative process is really done in salary to ensure that the child is integrated safely. Um, and also considering, uh, first and foremost, the best interest of the child, whether the child goes to the biological family or whether the child goes to a foster family, even if the biological family is there, sometimes we, for the best interest of the child, the child may be placed in kinship care or even in foster care, even if the biological family is there for some reasons. This depends on the assessment, uh, during the assessment, what are the findings that are guiding the placement decision. And the key people who are involved are, of course, uh, the national uh, children and the families themselves, but there, is, there are also the staff of the institution, they play a key role because they are the ones who are giving like uh, key information or background information on the child for the whole time the child has spent in the institution, which help the, the professional to, to identify even the family or to know more about the, the child and to be able to consider all the, all the information and make a, a case that can help to take informed decision. And they are also the officer in charge of social affairs at the sector level. Sector level is a sector is an, a, a geographic entity under the district. And there is, a, of course, other government uh, partners like the disability mainstreaming officers. These are the uh, regular staff from the National Council of Persons with Disabilities who are deployed at each district. They are really uh, very. Um, Collaborating, collaborating, sorry, they are collaborating very uh, much with the, the professionals, the national child, child protection professionals at the district level, especially providing on special needs and on accessing services for the special needs. And also there are what we call with gender and the family promotion officers at the district level. This is about also all the welfare of families in general. Also uh, civil society and the faith-based organization are playing another role and the community volunteers, including our friends of the family, uh, especially for uh, post placement uh, follow up and support. Yeah, Monique can come back again to talk, uh, to conclude on. Uh, Great, uh, if we could just keep the conclusion down to a couple of minutes, because we're going to run out of time for the panel discussion otherwise. So over to sorry. you, Monique. <laughs> Um, I'll be brief uh, because this is uh, um, we go through for the steps where we go through uh, when we are uh, reintegrating these children. Uh, as you know, it started by registration. This is registered for every child in the center. Uh, here uh, we put much um, focus on child assessment and case plan because here we we need uh, we add different. Um, uh, professionals, depending on uh, uh, different aspects. We need uh, education specialists, we need psychologists, yes, we need social workers, we need the medical, because we have children, we're dealing with the children with disabilities and uh, other special needs. We go for family tracing because uh, these children have been abandoned in the, tra in the centers, but maybe the family may be arrived uh, in the different areas. We go for trace if there's any other uh, family relatives, it can be available. After doing this, we go for family assessment uh, to assess the capacity and the risk prior to the placement of the charge. 
Then we go for case management report and we go for case management meeting where we meet all these professionals to discuss uh, uh, whether the charge um, will be uh, reunified and where is the risk, where is uh, uh, how our case management can be implemented. That's where we it is done through or the case management meeting. After the case management meeting, we go for a placement decision. A decision is taken through this uh, meeting and say and decide whether the child will go back uh, to the uh, biological parents or extended family or a foster care uh, families. Uh, after the placement, we continue to, to, to prepare uh, this preparation, to make this decision. We go for the preparation of the child uh, who will be uh, integrated and also his family who are going to receive, but also the wider community because they want these children to be uh, fully integrated and supportive um, uh, through or their community uh, in order to avoid, um, to link, to, to, uh, first of all, to link them with the services in the community and also or to make the community friends and to avoid or to prevent stigma and discrimination. After this preparation, we reunify the charge with uh, the family, uh, depending on the placement decision, whether it is the family, a foster or independent living, because we have some children with minor uh, disability who can be live independently. After placement, we go for post-placement and follow-up. Uh, when we see where we can identify other needs or uh, continue to link uh, to other services or to refer for uh, yes, uh, linkage is go it goes together with reference where they can find other needed uh, services. After this placement, we go for case closure. Uh, I think that is the whole process. When you go for our operational guide, we see in the details what is being done or conducted during this process. Uh, what we do when we arrive in the institution, in the institutional care facility, first of all, we start to prepare this uh, staff because we want them to support us because they are the one who knows the, the more information about the children they are raising into this residential. Uh, they're the one who know their families, but also we need them to continue to support the children while they arrive in the community. Then after preparing this stuff, we go for family tracing, as I said, they assess the family who received the case, the charge and the case planning. Uh, here from the family tracing is whether we decide the family, the child will be back to his families. If not possible, we, uh, we see other alternative, but based, we are guided by the, by the principle of the best interest of the charge. When the family is in, will not receive, yes, we look at for another uh, family where uh, the family will be well cared and supported. Uh, and then um, it can be a family of origin. We, when it is not a family of origin, we go for a foster care families. Then you go for preparation. Here, what, the new things I want to mention is here uh, during the 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 reunification of placement, we have also to make sure that the child will be able or to live and to be well cared. And also we accommodate uh, the house and also uh, the, the path, the path in the uh, in the house. It's where we, we make much attention on how more accessibility, accessibility, physical accessibility of the child also and accessibility to the services. That's why we go through all these steps and make sure that preparation is well conducted. Uh, the child has visited the family and the family visits the child in the center. And then we go uh, for uh, at the step of saying that this child can be uh, reintegrated or be reunified with this family. And then we go for post placement till we will close the case. Where we see we, we meet all our benchmarks that was set during a case uh, plan. Next slide. Okay, we, we're, yes. we're, we're really gonna have to stop the presentation because we're not gonna have any time left for the panel discussion. So if you can just give literally a minute just yes. to wrap up, that yes. would be great. Thank okay. You. I think this is the last, um, is the last since we are all this inclusive. We have, as we said, you have already integrated 67. Uh, children with disabilities into their families and they are well cared into family-based care. 
Uh, we have foster families because they want, we don't want other children to be separate and go for centers. Then we have um, uh, Izu who are visiting these uh, children into uh, families and also have the support of other uh, civil societies and NGOs. Here we have uh, uh, a chance for childhood while backing up in the community and providing uh, community-based uh, um, services like community rehabilitation, family strengthening and empowerment through parent support groups where they meet and also or, uh, have a physiotherapist in place to help them to continue caring children into the community. I think that is the last and the uh, others will go for questions and uh, I can thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was a great presentation. Um, we have overrun slightly, so um, we're going to uh, go straight into the panel discussion. Um, before we, and we're going to skip the first question and then go straight into the second question for that. I'm going to ask a few questions initially, and then there'll be an opportunity for the participants in the webinar to ask some questions. So before we begin, um, we've already met two men members of the panel, which are Monique and Genevieve. Um, I also wanted to introduce, uh, if you could put your videos on, the other panel members, that would be fantastic. Uh, Mr. Alexi Ruzibiza, are you there, Alexi? You... Oh, sorry, I just have to mute that person who is speaking. Hi, hi, Can you? are you able to put your video on? So we can see. Okay. And we also have while well, Alexi is just doing that. There we go. Alexi yeah, is so um, a, a social worker uh, working in Huey District in Rwanda. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to mute. If if the participants could please keep their um, on mute, not the panel, but everybody else, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Um, and we, we're also really delighted to have with us, sitting in the UNICEF office, um, Miss Adele New Rabbit Taweo, who is one of the ISU volunteers that were mentioned in the introduction. Um, and she's sitting there in the UNICEF office next to Genevieve. And finally, last but not least, I hope we have um, Mr. Oswald Tuizere. Um, from the National Council of Persons with Disability in Rwanda. Are you there, Oswald? Could you give us a little wave if you are? Or just yes, say I'm hello. there. Oh, wonderful. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to have you with us. Thanks for joining us. Right, so my first question um, goes to Alexis, um, which is, I know that you've worked uh, with children with disabilities, but also with families that don't have children with disabilities in the reintegration process. So can you tell us how did you adjust the steps in the reintegration work you were doing to work with children with disabilities? And what are some of the lessons that you've learned through being a social worker and working with this group? Please go ahead, Alexi. Uh, my name is Alex. Huh? Zibiza, child protection, uh, working uh, in a, one of a center of uh, uh, Adar to Jose, who hosted children with disabilities. One of the lessons learned during the process of reintegrating uh, those children with disability is that uh, at the beginning of uh, the process, was uh, so difficult for me to understand how children with disability can live in the family where uh, some parents say uh, it's, a, it's a burden for us to, to receive the children. They don't, uh, many, or many of them, they don't uh, visit those children they are in the center. So uh, the lesson learned is that uh, when we integrate, when we prepare families or discuss with those uh, parents, one lesson learned is that uh, most parents don't understand the program, but through many discussion, many preparation, group session, 
uh, those parents understand well uh, to uh, to receive those their their children to come back on their home or the community. Uh, but uh, when the those children arrive in the community, some of them say it's in the community around they don't understand how the, the parents will take care of that children. But uh, more they live with that children, they saw how they perform some activity. Because before those parents, they say those children will be, will be not able to, to do anything. But meantime, when the children and the home, they go take take uh, water. They perform some activities. Uh, and then, when we do the post placement support, some parents says uh, we understand well how the children with disability are the children who can live in the community, who have the capability to to do some activities. Uh, to perform some things that uh, before the program, they say these children will not be able to do anything. So they say, no, I'm not able, I don't understand how I, I will take care of my children. But when I have in the, in the, in the family, there's uh, some changes. Uh, we have uh, an example for one children he spent five years uh, in the in the institution without uh, say something. Don't speak. We ask something. They say no. They don't speak. But once they arrive in the community or the family, one of the child started to to speak something. That was uh, amazing. For us, that the one the lesson learned for uh, the process or the program for integrating children with disability. Also, uh, there's some children who go to school, and before we are preparing the family, they say, No, we are not able to, these children be not able to go to school, but for now, some of the children go to school. There is a a boy called David, so he performed well in school. Uh, so uh, that's the the lesson learned Thank for you. the program or the process. That's wonderful. It, it sounds like once you start the process of reintegration, you can quite quickly parents start to learn how um, the children can uh, integrate into the community much more effectively than they'd originally assumed. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for that. The next question um, goes to Adele, who is our Izu, who is present with us here. Um, can you tell us a bit about some of the challenges that children with disabilities in their communities face? And how have you supported the return of children with disabilities back into their families? So we're going to have some, some translation. <laughs> Thank you, Genevieve, for offering that translation. Please go ahead. Oh, you need to take yourselves off mute. Murakoze, nitwa Adel Nyabiti Taweho. Thank you, my name is Adel Nyabiti Taweho. Di shuti umurijango, ikora mumurenji wa jikondo, kareka chitukiro. I am a friend of the family, shuti umurijango, from Kichukiro district, uh, the jikondo sector. Murkwe gorba wakora rabushache, wakora ramumidugudu, wakora ramumidugudu wa mare wa yakaviri. Uh, as part of the child protection volunteers in uh, all villages, me, I am in Marembo. Uh, our main mandate is to support children and to ensure that their rights are, are fulfilled. Also supporting their families to be able to care for their children. Uh, 
Yeah, the main problems that they have seen with, uh, in the community where they have uh, families with children with disabilities. Uh, first of all, there is the problem of caring for their children, especially because those families, most of the time, they are in poverty. Um, uh, the friends of the, the family, they are always a pair of male and female. So they do uh, frequent home visits to those families and um, advise them on how to take care of those children with disabilities. Yeah, they, those children are having different problems. For example, um, they are not really taken care of, like for the, they are not clean enough. They don't uh, have the possibility to access health care. Some are not uh, registered. Uh, they don't. They are not registered in, um, in with birth registration. Uh, some are not also sent to to school, even if uh, families are able to to provide for the schooling. Tusuriyo miriango kabashishkariza kuita kura wana. So during the the home visit, they are. Um, they are promote, they are supporting them, they are sustaining them to send those children uh, to school and to take care of them. Yeah, because and the, 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 she said that the trainings that they have received are really helping them because they know how to, to deal with the different issues affecting those children with disabilities and how to talk with their families. And they, they take the, the support that they got for this training for different institutions. Yeah, before the training, they could visit, but not being able to know exactly what to do. But now with the training, they are able to provide the right information and the right support. Uh, sometimes they take different families and they put them together in a group. And they, they put them in a the group and they use the, the tools that they have received on uh, introducing them and giving them information on taking care of their children with disabilities. And they put them in the support groups where they can continue sharing their experiences. Uh, uh, they also give them information on where to access the service and how to access the services and they support them to access the services. And we also monitor that children with disabilities are not facing the violence. Also supporting them and sustaining them to do something that can help them to, 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 to advance or to improve the being in the families. Yeah, 
bite kuri babana they also some uh, sometimes take um, uh, lead the community taking them through a dialogue community dialogue to sensitize the community as a way to prevent the stigma and the discrimination but also at the same time sensitizing families to take care of those children dukora no buvugizi ku bibazo byawo ko badukuriye kugira ngo ibibazo byawo bisubize also they do advocacy with the, the local authorities so that they can start addressing their their special needs thank you very much Thank you so much. That was a, a really great answer. Really, really fascinating. Thank you. Um, I'm sure people will have some additional questions for Adele at the end as well. Um, okay. Um, my last question from me, and then we'll go into some Q&A, goes to Oswald, who is the head of the uh, National Council for Persons with Disabilities. Are you able to, to speak with us? Oh, I think we might have lost him. Are you there, Oswald? Okay, um, well, we might have time to go back to the first question that I had on my list, which goes to um, Monique and Genevieve around, could you please tell us a bit more about um, how um, uh, you adjusted the case management guidance to, uh, work with children with disabilities how it was different that guidance uh, for the guidance that you may have provided for other families thank you, you. maybe i can okay. take this one great yeah, thank uh, you yeah thank you emily uh, monique will maybe also come in to complete if i the first thing that was done operational guide was to ensure that everything that was part of this guide was inclusive. Starting by the context, uh, the context was previously just relating to the global uh, treaties like UNCRC, the UNCDO, the CDO, but then there is also uh, the UNCRPD what was introduced in the global context where we talk especially because also the UNCRPD talks about uh, the right to family for every person with disabilities and the, uh, also for children, of course. And uh, there is also uh, the recent UN guideline on, uh, on uh, our children, on, on family care for children, for all children in general. And uh, also the laws and the, all the political, political instruments, but also, uh, at some, uh, I can mainly focus on part three of that I mentioned before on job aid. This is a new chapter that was included in this operational guide, which was not there before, which is specifically focusing on the children with disabilities, on giving the key information on disability, because the professionals and the social workers were uh, mainly before trained on child protection in general, but there was no focus no information on, on disability. So that job aid is a very good tool where they can always uh, like uh, refer to when they are do conducting the 12 steps that Monica has talked about. Whenever they meet, they face, for example, this type of disability, they go back to the operational guide to the job aid, part three, and they consult what to do in this particular case. Who is a, who, who else can support on this case? And uh, also there are the, the case management forms, as Monica was saying. The assessment previously it was mentioning some people, but there was no special no specific needs uh, included in the assessment form, for example. All the forms have been revised, and there was a new one introduced, the one the one on home accessibility audit which is, uh, it is in Kenya, Rwanda, unfortunately, we have, I don't know if we share it or not here, uh, but it was also used by other um, NGOs here in the, the National Council of Persons with Disabilities on uh, audit, uh, in auditing at physical accessibility. This one helps you to see, to check what is the environment where the child, the physical environment where the child is going to go, 
and comparing it to the special needs, the disability, for example, if the child is using a wheelchair, will the child be able, the wheelchair be able to enter uh, the door of the house? Sometimes they are uh, part of the, the, the support to the family, they have to support on some of rehabilitation of the house to enlarge the door, for example, to be able to have the child in and out, to make the pathways to enter into the house, etc. So there are uh, the toilet, for example, how is the child able to use the toilet? This is part of that home accessibility audit. And uh, there is also on case management, uh, case management meetings, it has expanded to include children with disabilities. Uh, previously, now they have started including people, those persons who can advise on specific needs of children, for example, the, someone who is in, in charge of health, someone who knows about the physiotherapy, someone who uh, uh, staff from the National Council of Persons with Disabilities also, or someone who can advise on any other type, depending on the type and the level of disability of the child, the case management meeting uh, participation is, is defined depending on the person that they have. I think uh, maybe Monique can add on this one. Um, I saw so the back also. Thank you. Uh, Monique, I, I can see that Oswald is now able to speak with us as well. So we'll come to you in a second. I'll just check first. Monique, did you want to add anything? Uh, it's a few. Uh, this guide is, uh, goes together, as we see in our presentation, with the minimum standards. Uh, because we know every child who are in the centre, can, not all of them will be uh, placed. But we want them to see those who remain in the in the center, both uh, specific and good services, depending on these standards. We have, uh, if we they remain there, we each services who are going to care for them. That's what is uh, what another thing I want to add uh, that goes together with this uh, guidance. But that all have been mentioned by my colleague Genevieve. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, just coming over to Oswald now, if you could tell us a bit about uh, the role that the NCDA played in this process of reintegrating children with disabilities. Sorry, the NCPD, NCPD. the National NCPD. Council of Persons with Disabilities in Rwanda. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Um, sorry for the poor network I had. Uh, um, Few, few few minutes ago, um, I was going to respond, but uh, where I was uh, sitting, there was a poor network. I think now, do, do you hear me? We can hear you perfectly, yes. Please go ahead. Okay. Yep. Thank you very much. Yeah, the NCPD, National Council of Persons with Disabilities, it's a public institution under Article 131, in the constitution. The main purpose of any is to advocate institution. Excuse me, the interpretation was disabled. Yeah, I don't. Sorry, I don't know why it was disabled. Uh, and it's just uh, apologies. It's just not um, allowing me to restart it. I, I didn't do anything to disable it. So, apologies. Could you just give me one second and I'll try and fix it? It's not letting me restart it. I'm sorry. I think we're going to have to continue without it. Apologies. Uh, <sighs> It just won't let me restart. Sorry, Oswald, you, you, you carry on and I'll see if I can resolve this. Um, please carry on okay. and I'll see if I yeah. can resolve this. Thank you very much for hosting us to this important uh, webinar meeting. I was just briefing you that the NCPD is a public institution under constitution. It was mandated by the, the law to um, advocate for all issues uh, that are hindering the welfare and inclusion of persons with disabilities. We started from the 2011 up to now. So we start um, 
assessing the existing framework that um, can protect personal disabilities in general. And uh, from 2012, we found out some more drafts, some political will, and so on. But finally, we, we decided to advocate for the, uh, the development of the national policy of personal disabilities. In 2014 uh, or 2017, we have managed to, to develop the national policy of personal disabilities and of financial support from UNICEF. And uh, through the policy, we mention how personal disabilities should be included in health, education, employment, culture, political life, and so on. In addition to this, we went through uh, by documenting what we are doing so far in order to make sure that the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Personal Disabilities is being implemented. From 2014 up to 2019, we have also developed the initial report of this convention, whereby at that level, we have captured key uh, information regarding the inclusion. So up to now, we are drafting the second, third, and fourth periodic report that we shall submit to Geneva in January 2023. So all of these works have been supported by UNICEF to ensure that we are uh, uh, we are on far front of ensuring the inclusion of personal disabilities is promoted. So in terms of children with disabilities, we are also working with UNICEF to to ensure that children with disabilities Oh dear, we seem, we seem to be having a few technical issues today. Um, I think we might have lost Oswald, momentarily at least. Access to, lack of access to basic services. Uh, NCPD works with the NCD. Uh, are you still hear, hearing me? We, we, well, I lost you anyway, just for a second there. So um, please, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. And now to, um, to reduce, even to fight against the mindset and the lack of access to basic services, we are working with NCD and UNICEF to ensure that all uh, Rwanda, including all parents who have children with diabetes, all local communities, all service providers, they are aware of key barriers that are hindering the personalities. So this is from this framework that we, we train local authorities on how they can take care of children with disabilities. We conduct accessibility um, audits in the families to ensure that those barriers are removed off. And we also work with, with local authorities to provide any additional support to ensure that those families can take back their children and thereafter some centers in which we have uh, uh, reduced the number of children and young adults with disabilities in those centers, we are transforming those centers into community hubs, whereby uh, not only the few children who remain there, but also the big number of personal abilities, they come to those centers to access or to get uh, basic services there mainly inclusive education, inclusive health and rehabilitation, and so on. We also work on uh, reduce um, a mindset uh, in general, whereby we use uh, what we call TV and radio talks and shows uh, in order to show the whole community on what they can do in terms of promoting inclusive society. So briefly, this is the work we are doing and we are still at the beginning because this is our second yes. year. Um, and we hope uh, that uh, uh, we shall move ahead by the next uh, year. Thank uh, you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was really, really helpful and great to hear about the uh, very valuable contribution that your organization is making to the process of reintegration. I apologize. I think we have lost the. Um, 
interpretation function. I can't get it to restart again. So apologies for that. Um, we have a few questions from participants. Um, the first is whether the ISU coordinate with other community volunteers, such as community health workers. I don't know if uh, you, uh, Genevieve and uh, Adele, would like to try and answer that question. Which question is it? So, uh, do the ISU coordinate with other community volunteers, such as health volunteers? Do they work alongside those other volunteers? Hmm. Yeah, they are collaborating with the community health workers, especially on nutrition, uh, so that they are the support on uh, uh, they support the families for nutrition intake, so that those children don't uh, get malnutrition. Yeah. Uh, the community health workers are, are, for example, demonstrating the families how to prepare a full diet, a comprehensive diet, comprehensive meal, uh, particularly because those children, they don't, uh, some of them don't eat any meal. Of course. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. That's really interesting. Thank you. Um, the next question is around who children are getting reintegrated back to. Is it usually their parents or are they going back into kinship care arrangements to grandparents, aunts and uncles, etc.? So I don't know who wants to answer that. <laughs> Monique, do you want to answer that question? Or perhaps Alexis? Yes. Yeah, you go ahead. Yes, please. Yes. Yes, uh, as we saw in our steps, so we have uh, a step of family tracing and also uh, uh, on the, the family assessment. When the family, the children who have their own parents, when the assessment shows that they are able to care uh, their children, they are reunified with them. But there is some times where we can find, even if the family is arrived, the children cannot be well cared that family. For example, we found the families in the separation or in divorce, so in a conflict, so that they cannot uh, be able. They have not. They don't have that capacity to care for their, that children. That's why you can look for extended families to care. That we call kinship or extended families, so the child can be cared there. When all both uh, uh, options are not possible, we can look for a foster. But we have uh, during the, 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 all those process, we have some um, document are being signed. When we we, we decide to to place the child in other families, the biological family have to provide a consent. And here in our family law, it is accepted to be a guardian or to have a simple adoption for a child who has parents, but while we are showing um, the reason why the child can be looked or can be cared by another family apart from their biological families, it is a case by case, but the biological families are prioritized during this process but it depends also on this assessment. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. That was a really good explanation. Um, and then we have a question around, if you could provide more details about the package of support that uh, children are uh, receiving and families are receiving, including whether they receive any forms of financial support. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, there is a reintegration package because, as you know, we conduct assessment uh, to identify risk and needs. We provide some amount of money uh, to help the families to care for these children where necessary when the assessment has been uh, showing uh, that need. But also we are working with the community. We link them. As you know, here in Rwanda, we have categories uh, of uh, uh, the people depending on their uh, economy. And children and families who have children's disabilities, they have their own category where they are being supported through or child protection schemes, where they provide, they, they get uh, direct support. 
they they are being supported by the government also uh, by working from the with the government also we gain uh, support on the level of community insurance. Now we are uh, with we are together with the support of Minister of Health. Now, uh, children who have disabilities can be uh, treated in different hospitals, visit hospitals and health centers using health insurance, and also when they need it is become to the other special needs. Also, government provides uh, the support. Yeah, and if somebody uh, during the process, yes, there is an integration package that is um, which is provided. But when arrived in the community, also the family and the child is being cared through the child protection schemes, which are available in the community from different uh, service providers. Thank you. Thank you. That's wonderful. Um, the next question is um, from uh, UNICEF in Kenya. And it's our experiences in Kenya were that some, were, was that there were some really complex disability cases that required highly skilled, a highly skilled workforce for support, sometimes beyond the child protection social service workforce. How do you deal with those kinds of cases where the needs are particularly complex and specialised? I don't know who wants to answer that question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I can talk on this one. Uh, as I was telling you before, um, it, from the beginning, what you have to realize for children with disabilities, it, the process is not as fast as we have gone through the other, the institutionalization of children without disabilities. So this is why uh, we have, um, there was um, a thinking that not every child would be able to be placed in families. So in the, in the meantime, within this process, the priority has been given to the cases which, are, uh, which can be addressed uh, easily, more easily, and then going back to those that are severe. So some children are remaining in institutions because for their best interest during the assessment, it was realized that it's better that they, for the meantime, they, they stay in the institution as the other options are being explored. So this is why also there were this, those SOPs, the minimum standards of care for, for institution. It's not because we, the government or we didn't know that uh, it is not, it, the preference would be, the best would be that the child be in the family, but when it's not really possible, those children are in the meantime remaining in the institution, but with improved the service, uh, services uh, being provided to those children. And you can see from the, the maybe that the, from those SOPs, there are three categories as I have said, that some are for daycare, others are for residential, the big residential care, but there are also SOPs for special homes. That's one which looks like family-like. Uh, it's a grouping of just a, a, a limited number of children in the SOPs, they talk about between six and eight children to be cared before as by the special needs, rather than having a, like a, a big residential care with uh, 100 children mixed with the different types of disabilities mixed together. Sometimes with the caregivers, we don't necessarily have the specific speciality for each type of disability. So there is this plan also, but it is not yet, we are not yet there, but it is in the plan. In the meantime, they are staying in the institution where they are already. Thank you. Thank you no, so I'm much. For this. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Thank you. In addition to what Geneva says, we at NCBD, we also uh, include those vulnerable children in what we call social protection programs, whereby by the new guidelines, in the case of family has a child with severe disabilities, uh, it is given on a monthly basis uh, cash transfers. So the few money that they receive on a monthly basis, it helps them to take care of them but also to, to always, always uh, provide the uh, uh, rehabilitation services, go to the hospital and so on. We also include them in what you call nutritional programs. I think at any they can say it better. 
In the case you have a vulnerable child, especially the child who was living in the center, the family also is mainstreamed in the nutritional programs so that the child protection can also uh, promote it at that level. Uh, thank you very much. Thank, thank you so much for that addition. That's fantastic. I think we are just about out of time. I think we've managed to get through the questions that were asked. There's, there were a couple of great comments from uh, from uh, Vladimir, um, who I believe is from uh, the government of Mozambique, who's explaining how the experience in Mozambique is quite similar to what you've presented. Um, but that they place a sort of maybe a greater emphasis on community childcare initiatives and the involvement of community organisations. And also a very supportive message from um, uh, UNICEF in Cote d'Ivoire around uh, sharing this experience and how helpful they found it to be. Um, so thank you so much for uh, your, your presentations and the contributions of the panel. We really appreciated learning about your experiences in Rwanda. Um, Bertha from Child Frontiers, who um, is the project assistant on, on the platform and the learning platform, has shared lots of links with you in the chat box. So you can go and have a look at the presentation. Um, we're going to be recording um, this webinar and posting it on our YouTube channel. And we have a number of different publications um, around uh, care issues on the UNICEF website for the regional learning platform on care reform, including around issues around disability. So do take a look at all of that. Um, and if you want to sign up to our mailing list, you can also contact us and we can add you to that list. Um, and I apologize for the uh, challenges with the interpretation. Uh, Mona, I'm gonna hand back over to you just to wrap up and uh, say goodbye to everyone. Um, Mona, uh, just, just to let everybody know before Mona speaks that our next webinar, we think will be at towards the end of January um, and that will be on prevention and preventing family separation. Um, so I'll be in touch near the time to uh, tell you exactly when that's going to be. Over to you, Mona. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emily. And what a wonderful and very informative session. Um, I really uh, enjoyed listening in to colleagues from Rwanda, you know, uh, sharing their experiences of the reintegration of children with disabilities into family care based care. For me, what I take home is that, again, that phrase we, we use in Rwanda and elsewhere, you know, disability is not an inability. And it is very possible to find a family based care option for children with disability. So it's a message of hope. And, uh, and I hope. Uh, uh, you too, uh, all the participants who managed to connect today have learned one or two new things that you can you can further reflect on and uh, contextualize to, to your respective countries. Um, I think uh, in terms of the surveys that you like uh, your feedback on, um, Bertha will be posting the, the, a short survey. Uh, we really like to get some feedback from you on the platform so that we can promote it amongst the, not just only our donors, but also for ourselves to improve how we are managing the sessions on the or, or for, for this uh, virtual learning platform. I'm very pleased to have seen colleagues connecting from other regions. I've noticed, noted a few and some old colleagues who managed to join us today and really spread the word. We will ensure that uh, we continue to have simultaneous uh, interpretation in French and Portuguese. So do spread the words to your colleagues in the countries that are, um, are Francophone and Lusophone to join us if they're interested in learning more uh, on, uh, on care for children. And as Emily also mentioned, we have a new video resource on reintegration of children with disabilities, and uh, it will be posted on the link, and we can continue to share these uh, uh, YouTube links on our newsletter so that you are able to access and share widely within your networks. Um, and as it has been announced, you know, uh, this really marks the end of our okay. webinar sessions for 2022. And uh, the next webinar will be on preventing family separation. It will take place in January. The date will soon be, Ari, I'm sorry, the, the, the details of the dates will soon be announced. Uh, with that, I thank you all so very much and wishing everybody a very happy and festive season and uh, goodbye for now. Thank you. Thank you.